Example 136. When investigating the link between birth weights and IQ scores, researchers found that 28 subjects with birth weights less than 1,000 grams had a mean IQ of 95.5 and a standard deviation of 16.0. For 27 subjects with normal birth weights, the mean IQ was 104.9 with a standard deviation of 14.5. At the 5% significance level, Tesla claimed that low birth weight children have lower IQs than normal birth weight children. Assume IQ scores are normally distributed and the variances are equal. Is there a possible problem with the assumption of equal variances here? Okay, so when I read the problem, the first thing I want to notice is that it says test the claim. So this is a hypothesis testing problem. And I can also tell they're comparing two groups, right? They're looking at low birth weight children and normal birth weight children. They want to compare their IQ scores. So I believe this is probably going to be an independent t-test to compare two means. Now, I say the t-test as opposed to the z-test because the sample sizes are both small here, 28 and 27. So small sample sizes two independent groups being compared. It sounds like an independent t-test. So I'm going to write the claim out first. And what I want to say in my claim is exactly what they said, right? They said that the low birth weight children have lower IQ scores than normal birth weight children. So I want to compare two groups, the mean for two groups specifically. So I'm going to compare the mean for the low birth weight children to the mean for the normal birth weight children. And what I'm comparing is their mean IQ scores. And according to the problem, the low birth weight children should have a lower, so I'll put less than, they should have a lower IQ than the normal birth weight children. So that's your claim. Let's go to HO and HA. To get the alternative hypothesis and the null hypothesis, I'm going to look at the claim and identify its symbol. Its symbol is less than, that means it's the alternative hypothesis. So I'm going to put that there. Now once I've done that, I'm going to look at the null hypothesis and say, what's the opposite of less than? Well, that is going to be greater than or equal to. So I have my claims, my HO, my HA. Let's begin to put down the data. Now because I have low birth weight children first here, I'm going to put my data in that order as well. So I'm going to get the sample size for low birth weight children, the sample mean, the standard deviation, and I'll have an alpha in the problem that I'll record. So for low birth weight children, it says that they had a sample size of 28. And among that group, the sample mean IQ was 95.5. The standard deviation was 16.0. The alpha is 5% in the problem. Going on here to the normal birth weight side, the N for that group was 27, the sample mean for that group was 104.9, and the standard deviation they say is 14.5. Okay, so we have low and normal. Now from there our next step of the process is to go ahead and um, determine our test statistic for the problem. Because of the small sample sizes, we know it's a t-test statistic, and the formula is pretty similar to what it was before we'll have a sample mean minus a sample mean on top. Which one goes first? Well, remember, if the claim used L first and L here in the data first because of that, we'll put L here first. And that means this one gets the N. In other words, we put the low birth weight sample mean before the normal birth weight sample mean. We have to be consistent. If we use L first here, we use it first in the data, we use it first in the test stat formula difference. And then we have the square root of and now here's where this equal variances comes in. We're going to use the pooled sample variance. We're going to pool these two sample variances together to form a pooled estimator. And that will be the sample size for the first group divided by the sample size for the second group here. And that is our formula. So from there, clearly I'm going to need this pooled estimator, so I might as well take the time out to calculate it now. Remember that this estimator has the following structure. It's the degrees of freedom for the first group times its variance squared, right? Sorry, not its variance squared, its standard deviation squared, or its variance in other words, plus the degrees of freedom for the second group times its variance. And then lastly, we divide by the degrees of freedom, which is just n1 plus n2 minus 2, or you can write n1 minus 1, and 2 minus 1. That's the same thing with a plus sign between them. All right, now from there, once we have the formula, we're going to plug in the numbers. Look, if you take 1 from here away, you'll get 27, right? Times the 16 squared plus, you take 1 from this number, you get 26 times the 14.5 squared. All right, and once you have that done, you'll divide by n1 plus n2 minus 2. n1 is 28 plus n2, which is 27, minus 2. 
that's going to essentially be 53 there in the denominator. Let's go ahead and work the whole thing out though with our calculator. So I'm going to put all of this in the top here, so 27 times 16 squared plus 26 times 14.5 squared. Then I'm going to close that up and I'm going to divide by, and I could put the whole thing in parentheses and work it out, 28 plus 27 minus 2, or I could have just typed in the 53. It all depends if you're comfortable doing that in your head or not, but either way, you have your estimator then. The pooled estimator for the variance is 233.55 dot dot dot. It's going to keep going on and on. I'm going to store it in my calculator so I have it for later. You can just write a few extra decimal places down if you don't want to do that. All right, let's plug this number now or these numbers now into our formula. So the sample means are going to be 95.5 minus 104.9 all divided by the square root of 233.6. I'm rounding it here only because I don't want to have to write all these decimal places, but remember I'm going to use the full thing in my calculator, right? So 28 plus 233.6 over 27. And again, I'm not really using the rounded off value, I'm just writing it there. Okay, so let's get the answer then. So I'll use in the parentheses on top for the top of this fraction, 95.5 minus 104.9, close that up, divide by the square root of, and now here's where that stored variable comes in handy. I'll do x divided by 28 plus x divided by 27, so that makes my work a little easier to enter. And when I hit enter there, I get negative 2.28, so negative 2.28, and that is my test stat. All right, now, in hypothesis testing, when you're using the traditional method to test the hypothesis, once you have the test stat, you need to compare it against a critical value. So let's go ahead and draw the bell curve here and determine what kind of test we're dealing with by looking at the alternative hypothesis. So if you look at the alternative hypothesis, the symbol is pointing to the left. That means it's a left-tailed test, right? It's a left-tailed test. The alpha is going to be the area in that tail. So we're going to say the alpha here, or the area in the tail, is 0 0.05. So it's a one-tailed test with 5% in the tail. And the degrees of freedom here, remember, is the, the denominator here of this sp squared thing. It's 28 plus 27 minus 2 or the sum of the two separate degrees of freedom. Either way, when you do that work, you're going to find the answer to be 53, right? Because uh, 26 plus 20, um, or sorry, pardon me, excuse me, 27 plus 26 is going to end up giving you 53. Okay, so once you have the degrees of freedom and you have the alpha in one tail, let's go to the table and look those values up to see what our critical value is. Don't forget also that because this is zeroed in the center, it's going to be a negative answer. So the table is not going to give us the negative. We have to remember to write it in our cells. All right, let's go get that number then. Okay, so we're looking at 0 0.05 with 53 degrees of freedom. So we're going to have to move the page down a little bit so we can see that row. And when you look here, there is no 53 degrees of freedom. There's 50 and there's 55. We're going to take the more conservative number here. The more conservative number is the bigger one of the two. So we're going to take the one in the 50 row, which is 1.676. 1 1.676. Okay, so we chose the conservative value of 1.676 as our critical value because our specific value of 53 degrees of freedom was not on the table. Now from there we're going to take our test stat and put it on the curve and see where it lands. So you can clearly see that negative 2.28 will actually fall in the rejection region. It will fall on the tail where the rejection region is, so we're going to say that we reject HO. So we reject HO and therefore we support HA. We support HA. So that is your initial conclusion. Now from there you know the routine, we're going to look at the claim and say hey that claim is the same as HA in this problem so we're going to use our wording here that goes with HA. So we should say we support the claim. So the sample data supports the claim. So the sample data, the sample data supports the claim. And what is the claim here in this problem? Well, the claim is that the mean IQ, the average IQ for low birth weight children is lower than the average IQ for normal birth weight children. 
And then finally, the problem asks, is there a possible problem with the assumption of equal variances here? Well, you know, if we look at the sample variances, there seems to be some difference between them. It's not a huge difference, though, so it could be simply that, you know, due to sampling error, um, you know, there are some differences between the two samples, standard deviations we found. However, um, to be sure, you know, we're going to learn later on a procedure called the F-test. We would be able to test to see if these um, variances or standard deviations seem to be significantly different or not. But in this problem, they asked us to assume they were equal, so we ran the test with that assumption, and we came to our conclusion. And it looks like, to me, this test stat is pretty extreme anyway, so I think um, no matter what we did here, we would have the same conclusion that we should reject the null hypothesis and therefore support the alternative.